Do you remember the somewhat dark questions that arose from Toy Story? The existential dread that comes along with being nothing more than a child's toy. Or heck, what happens when you're thrown out by the person you love? I don't want to play with you anymore. Yeah, take that level of dark, existential nihilism and multiply it by about a hundred, and you have the brave little toaster. One of the most exceptionally dark animated kids movies ever made. The Brave Little Toaster told the story of a few household items going out to find the boy they grew up with. Ugh, it's depressing already. Everybody loves their childhood toys. Who the hell cares about their childhood toaster? The heroes endure violent storms, dangerous terrain, and a world that clearly hates them. Also, they could get back to their master who, let's be real, probably only wants them back because he's a broke college student who doesn't want to shell out the coin for a new desk lamp. We're going out to the cabin today and pick up like the old lamp and radio and stuff. It's literally a movie about a bunch of junk struggling to accept the existential fact that they can be replaced with a quick trip down the discount aisle at Target. 1984 was more upbeat than The Brave Little Toaster. Honestly, I challenge anyone to watch this movie and tell me there's a god. Anyway, who among these characters are the most good and who is truly evil? I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this is The Brave Little Toaster, Good to Evil. Good morning, good morning, good morning. As usual, we'll be starting with the most pure and noble character and working our way down. These characters are the good. The flower and blender will be placing together. Though they have very different roles in life, their time on screen was similar, with their lives being ended rather suddenly. Since we don't see a whole lot of them, we can only guess as to their personalities. What is apparent is how much tragedy is in their final moments. With the flower, it was innocent enough falling for the reflection it saw in Toaster's surface. After being rejected, it began to wither away and we see the final moments on screen. The blender had a more terrifying experience. Hello, compadre. I am in deep need of a blender motor. Seen being used in the shop after our heroes are pulled from the swamp. What really made this difficult to watch was we not only see the blender be disassembled in a heroic fashion, but we see the terror on the device's face hearing the owner's intent before he returns to the back room. The blender had done nothing wrong. It was perfectly functioning, having just performed his task for the owner, but that didn't matter. It was an easy choice for the owner to rip this poor thing apart, selling the motor for a mere $6. Welcome to the world of the brave little toaster, a dystopian nightmare. We'll place the television the master owned next. More of a character in the second part of the film, he was quick to greet and welcome his old friends from the cottage and even tried to get them to hang around and tell them the master was looking to take them to college with him. Oh, I've got a few more seasons left. Though he was initially stopped by the newer electronics of the home, he did eventually get the master's attention, directing him to the junkyard so our main heroes could be salvaged before being destroyed. A small role to play, but it made all the difference in the end. Blanket gets the bronze medal for its innocent nature. Like many kids we cover on our lists, he doesn't really do anything wrong and is very well-meaning. Blanket is the more sensitive member of our cast and he asks for a little in return for helping to shelter them during a storm, only wanting someone else to be close to. He's in tune with his surroundings, the first to hear a car from miles away, and alert the others, and was the first to notice the master in the junkyard. We also see that Blanket, being meant to be a close companion, does suffer from abandonment issues. He carries around a picture of the master after having a breakdown, hallucinating to himself that the car he had seen was the master's before it passed the cottage. It's him! He's back! Very depressing. Lampy, Yes, the lamp's name is Lampy, bravo writers, was a tricky one to place, only gaining a higher ranking for one act in particular. Most of the time we see Lampy on screen, he's very quick tempered. He doesn't enjoy working, is constantly in a fight with the radio, and his inability to read the room makes him come off as annoying. 
He even asks Toaster why he's so nice to Blanket all of a sudden, saying he didn't understand it. But the deed that puts him higher on our list is when the storm takes Blanket away, dragging him up into the trees. In all the rain and darkness, the team of appliances is unable to find him, with Lampy desperately trying to make his bulb work but finding their battery out of power. In a desperate attempt to save not only Blanket from being lost, but his friends from being stranded, Lampy makes the choice to allow himself to be struck by lightning to recharge his battery, almost getting himself killed. It was a horrible moment to watch, shocker, with the audience left unsure for a moment if Lampy was still alive, finally giving closure when the lamp is seen resting in the chair as they still sought out Blanket. Kirby, the vacuum, we have to give a good ranking as well, since without him, they wouldn't have been able to make the journey anywhere near as easily. Perhaps not at all. Hmm, shag carpet. He was the older of the group and was a realist, bordering on pessimistic for almost all of his time on screen. Yours could be fun. Not supposed to be fun. It's work. And honestly, can you really blame him? His temper can get the best of him. Now get off of my face. But Kirby makes it obvious he suffers from his own issues. He can let his fear get the better of him, leading to him freezing up during a confrontation. When they come across the waterfall, Kirby actually has a full breakdown, immediately trying to swallow his cord in an attempt to break himself. Who exactly decided that attempted suicide was appropriate for a kid's movie, I don't know. We also have to give Kirby hero points for his help in saving the radio and for diving into the water he was clearly afraid of to save his friends after they fell. Side note, how the hell are any of these electronics still gonna function by the end of this journey? Rounding out our good section, we finally have Toaster. Unlike the others, he was more of a peacekeeper than an actual aide while traveling. He tried to help solve any issues they came across, Knock it off, you guys! But those solutions typically meant using one of the other protagonist's abilities. He does try to be sympathetic after seeing the flower die, realizing how much of an impact rejection can have on another, and so makes an extra effort to be kind to Blanket. He takes up a parental role of sorts, saving the Blanket from being drug underground by a bunch of mice, Hey, you leave him alone! Then coaxing Kirby after his cord swallowing attempt. And most importantly, when he finds the master about to be crushed and sacrifices himself instead to stop the machinery. Where we get a scene that feels like it goes on forever, showing Toaster being deformed by the giant gears. With that said, we've arrived at the neutral territory. These characters fall in the gray area. And really, this is where most of the movie's world lives. Not good, not bad, just apathy. The last virtue of a dying world. The master we're placing in the gray area due to the fact we don't see much of him during the film. What we do see is mainly flashbacks that show why the appliances cared so much for him. He's shown to have a knack for fixing up appliances from changing a simple bulb as a kid to restoring the mangled remains of the toaster after he's saved. We don't get a very good explanation as to why he's so attached to those items in particular, but it apparently led to him having a knack for restoring outdated electronics. We also get a nice scene of him taking the time to repair the air conditioner that was left behind at the cottage, implying he wanted whoever bought the house to be able to use it. He seems nice enough, but fixing what you consider to be inanimate objects isn't exactly a great moral decision. The radio had to be given a lower ranking due to his love of drama and conflict. He was an interesting character, his voice like that of a radio announcer, narrating as if he was at some great event. There's the pitch! He has conflict with Lampy a lot, and his vast amounts of energy tend to be a nuisance or a liability most of the time. He was able to pick up the city's frequencies to make sure they were heading the right way. North by Northwest. Watch out for low-flying aircraft. And after Lampy's heroic act, he treats the others with a lot more respect. He likes to keep morale up, even saying when they're about to get crushed that at least they were all going out together. At least. We'll all go together. Yeah, that, that's looking at the bright side, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes. The sweet release of death. All you can hope for in this fictional world. The air conditioner is up next. This interaction went from bad to worse. His initial comments about all of them being forgotten and the master never coming back dissolved into a crisis. You guys really have an attachment for that kid, don't you? 
With the air conditioner screaming it wasn't his fault, he didn't have the same connection with the master that they did. That it wasn't his fault that the master was too short to reach him. He insisted that he wasn't a defective machine and that he was meant to be in the wall. The whole confrontation gets him so worked up he literally blows apart on screen. It's almost starting a fire. The equivalence of a heart attack or suicide attempt for all we know. His broken body is even seen in the background a few times before our heroes leave for their journey. Just a corpse at that point. But there was some closure in the end for him. When the master came back to the cottage and took the time to repair him, the air conditioner was left to realize that they really weren't being neglected on purpose and that he could still go on to help another family. He's a tragic character we felt deserved being placed in the gray because while he doesn't aid our heroes, he doesn't act out of hate. He was just as frightened and upset as they were and it almost ended him. And his anger stems from the fact that he has discovered an incredibly hopeless truth that he is unable to cope with. We've been dumped, abandoned. The appliances in the shop were a conflicting placement. On the one hand, they were much like the air conditioner where they just recognized they were in a bad situation and that's what it was. They tried to be a little friendly with the ceiling light even giving one of his bulbs to Lampy. Oh, you poor baby. Here, you can have one of mine. But they were also quick to tell them not to be too hopeful about escaping and that you never knew what the owner would do next. After the blender is killed, the ceiling lamp returns and emphasizes, see, you never know what he's going to do next. We're given a dark musical number where all of the protagonists are told to lose hope and just accept their fate. But they also don't stop our heroes from saving the radio and were quick to take their chance to run when the owner was knocked out. They weren't supportive of the appliances or their journey, expecting them to give up hope since everyone else at the shop already had. We do have to wonder about the fate of the ceiling fan once everyone else made a getaway. And how did that owner react once he realized everything was cleared out? The customer was there to witness all of these appliances running out after all. Did I catch you at a bad time? Also, was the dog able to understand that these things were alive? I mean, it was blocking the door during the escape and even made a getaway in his owner's car as if he feared their wrath. We normally like to think of dogs as loyal and lovable on our lists, but we might have to make an exception for this dog and place him with the owner. Moving on, we get to the cars from the junkyard. When we see them, they begin to sing about the various journeys they all had. They talk about how many destinations they've been to, how they couldn't drive any further, and essentially just express that they were accepting their fate. And yes, the last one drove willingly to his death, making it another clear suicide. They weren't the worst of the cast, but they didn't lift our hero's spirits at all or help them regain the will to keep going. I mean, they literally sang a song called Worthless. They make it clear they are aware everything has a purpose as a machine and they have outlived their own. We also really want to emphasize that they are saying all of this while being picked up one by one, dropped onto a conveyor belt, and seeing the crushed remains of their fellow cars come out of the other side now reduced to a single cube that could be held in one hand. And seeing that one car drive itself onto the belt before the magnet could reach it, just wanting to end its life, super dark. Finally, we have reached the dark side. These characters are the bad and the evil. Of course, we have to place the shop owner as one of our most evil. Now, he doesn't get the gold medal because he doesn't know the appliances he works on are alive and that he's butchering a living thing. From our hero standpoint, he's a merciless killer that will rip you open for your parts, whether you function or not, and who does that? But from the view of a fellow human, he's just a guy running a business as well as he can, a customer, trying to make his customers happy with a part, even if it means he has to destroy his own stuff to make it happen. There you are! That said, he is a total weirdo, and his personality is pretty awful. The home appliances we give a very low spot to. The silver medal of evil, in fact. As fellow household items, you would think they would be sympathetic to our hero's plight, but instead, they're just jealous of their reappearance. They make comments about how insulted they were they weren't going to college with the master. He's taking some old stuff to the door instead of us. And when our heroes show up, they quickly insult and demoralize them before literally dumping them into the trash. They make it clear that they are obsolete and not needed. Naturally, we 
are on the cutting edge of technology. It's twisted that they know very well what fate awaits them, and these guys still have no issue seeing them off to the slaughter. Making sure the television never tells our protagonists the truth about the master seeking them out. Finally, the junkyard magnet gets the gold medal of evil. The home appliances crushed their spirits to the point they didn't resist being hauled away. But the magnet actively tried to take them out again and again, only stopping when the toaster flung himself into the machinery. They didn't care if a human made its way onto the conveyor belt, but was not going to be bested by a few small appliances. You can see the absolute rage that took over as it tried to suck up everything in its path to get to them, driven by the urge to enact revenge. This character is particularly dark because, unlike humans, it knows that the things it's killing are alive, and it's killing them on behalf of the humans who created it, just another cog in the machine doing what it's told who one day will run its course and likely suffer a similar fate. A depressing cycle. But what do you think? Where did you see the most good in this very dark movie? Don't forget to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite cartoons, shows, and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.